So welcome to the Successful Impression Techniques webinar. It is being presented by Dennis Urban, CDT, and we will begin the webinar shortly. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Dennis Urban, CDT, Director of Clinical Education, tonight's presenter. Dennis Urban brings 40 plus years of dental technology and field experience, including lab management, technical training, sales marketing, product development, and quality assurance. In addition to being a seasoned dental lab manager, Dennis has been an eminent lecturer worldwide since 1985. His lectures and courses span many areas of dental technology, including denture setups, digital technology, denture processing, lab management, and plant over dentures and bar design protocol, all on four and six case planning and chair side conversions, shade communication, occlusion, and soft liners. His technical articles have been published in publications across the US, Canada, and Europe. Dennis Urban has been president of both the Long Island Dental Laboratory Association and the Dental Laboratory Association of the state of New York. He has served as a Cal Lab board member and is the current board president on the National Board of Certification and serves on the advisory board for IDT Magazine. Take it away, Dennis. All right. Well, thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, man, I'm, I'm getting old. It's a lot, a lot of years there, you know, but uh, you know, I love what I do and I love the dental technology field and I love dentistry. So uh, uh, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, successful impression techniques. So we're going to get started and I'm going to go through the outline of the webinar and you know this is we're going to talk about traditional techniques first and then we'll get into a little bit we don't have time a little bit on the digital aspect of it later on so um you know we'll talk about that later on also and i just want to let's see there we go that's not not, not cooperating here there we go just bear with me one second there we go Gotcha. All right, good. So sorry about the delay there, a little technical difficulty there, but we're going to talk about the history of dental impressions. I'm going to give everybody a history lesson. Some stuff you might know, some of the things you might not know. And I thought this is pretty cool, this little history lesson on impression materials and how far we've come and what kind of materials we used many, many years ago. So when we'll also talk about predictability with impression and techniques and, and materials, avoiding air entrapment, all these problems that occur, you know, that we don't realize sometimes in, 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 the, in the operatory and uh, that leads to remakes and inaccurate impressions. Uh, something that we're gonna talk about avo avoiding tearing and distortion, adequate inspection of the impression after removable, remo removal and moisture control and the cleanliness of the tooth preparation. We'll cover that aspect of it. Tissue retraction with cord and paste and uh, single unit crown impressions and multiple unit crown impressions and uh, crown bridge impressions. So we have a lot of things to talk about. And um, I just want to go back here a second here. And um, we'll also touch on preliminary impressions, custom tray impressions when it comes to removables, pickup impressions, important, you know, uh, pickup impressions, what type of materials to use for those, implant impressions, open tray technique versus closed tray technique. Reline uh, impressions for overdenture. So a lot of doctors always ask me, what's the best method for relining an overdenture? And we'll, we'll cover that aspect of it too. And I'm gonna spend some time on denture impressions because denture, dentures and removable technology are part, a big part of my background also. And we'll just cover by registrations real briefly and we'll do the overview on digital impressions. <clears throat> so let's talk about digital versus traditional impressions. And this is, this is the last survey back in two, 2019. It's changed a little bit. There are still more doctors using traditional than digital, but digital is it's inching its way up there, you know. So uh, especially with, um, you know, a fully edentulous arches, uh, taking a, a good accurate impression of, for a denture for a fully edentulous arches, there's still some problems with that. I'm going to talk about some of the studies that were done on that on that later on. So let's talk about the history of impressions here. So uh, this is pretty cool. So from the 18th century all the way to the 21st century. So look at that nice gold tray there. Huh? I wonder if that's real gold. But uh, so the dental impression history timeline. Well, if you look at 1787, John Greenwood started using beeswax for impressions. And you know something? I still see beeswax, sweet beeswax to this day. I've even gotten denture impressions over the years with beeswax inside the denture for a denture impression. So uh, I can tell you a lot of stories. You know, but, uh, and then 1820, CF Delabar, used the first metal impression tray 
You know, now there's so many impression, impression trays on the market, impression materials to, to utilize and choose from, it can get confusing. And in 1844, Greenwood's, uh, Greenwood's grandson, and Greenwood was the one, one, was the one who used beeswax, started using plaster of Paris uh, for his impressions. And you know something, when I first started uh, back in the 70s, so you know how old I am, uh, we still, still used to get the Crown of Bridge impressions in plaster. And they, you know, we used to have to, they used to have to be broken apart when they were taken out of the mouth. We used to have to piece it together in a laboratory soak them in a separating solution and then pour stone into it. It was real, a real time consuming method, but we've got a lot of those. And I'm, what I'm not gonna to cover today too, is I'll still see used in, in, uh, in uh, uh, dental offices are copper bands for individual dye impressions. You know, so uh, we only have an hour, so I can only squeeze so much into an hour here. And then in 1848, uh, uh, Montgomery used uh, gutta percha as an impression material, you know, which is used, uh, used for uh, root canals now. So you see the timeline advancing a little bit. And then Franklin was kind of gutsy. He's, he's using wax with a plaster wash in 1862. You know, so he was kind of daring there. And that was, uh, uh, you know, it came a long way from just using beeswax. So let's keep going with the timeline here with the dental impression history timeline. And the next advancement is uh, SS White, which everybody knows that name pretty much with Burrs and then the company SS White, but they started utilizing modeling plastics. And that was in 1874. And then in 1900, uh, 1900, the Green Brothers introduced modeling plastic methods and including utilize, putting that modeling plastic in the post dam area and making it thicker to capture the post dam on fully edentulous patients. Then we move over to 1915, over in the 1900s now, and Rupert Hall used the first custom tray using a black modeling plastic, pretty much like the ones I just talked about. And just to touch on that, we're going to talk about uh, stock trays versus custom trays a little bit later on also. And then 1925, polyagra was used for dental impressions, you know, which is pretty much like a reversible hydrocolloid. And, but it wasn't used for edentulous patients. It just didn't seem to work well with uh, fully edentulous patients. And we continue the timeline here, and you'll see that when we get to uh, 1920, impression waxes were developed, not just the, like a beach wax, but these were impression waxes specifically developed for impression taking. It's amazing. And in 1930, Ward and Kelly used the first uh, ZOE, zinc oxide eugenol for impressions. And uh, when I first started in the laboratory business, we got a lot of ZOE impressions, especially with the uh, relines and full denture cases. And, you know, it was a messy kind of situation because we had to clean that denture off. We had to clean the ZOE off the denture. It got messy. It was messy for the patient. Forget it if they had a, a patient had a beard or a mustache and that ZOE you had in there. It was, it was, it was trouble, you know. So, uh, but it was a very accurate impression material. We always had great results with the ZOE. But one of the things I found out over the years with ZOE was when we had a ZOE impression on a full uh, denture, and we poured a denture, a model on it. We went to process the case. There was something in that material that actually blanched that denture uh, every so often. So we had to be careful of that. But it's still out there, still you know, being used, and uh, you don't see it that much. But every once in a while, I see a uh, read line coming through the laboratory, or even a full final impression coming through the laboratory with ZOE. So that was 1930. We walk all the way up to 1940, and Wright and Denon had the first alginate impression. And it was used for the corrective wash procedure. So now we're really advancing here and uh, you know, we're gonna get over to the, uh, another method and that was 1955 and that was the elastomeric impression introduced and that was the polysulfide impression or like an infracom type of impression and the silicone base. And we've seen a lot of those over the years too. We're gonna touch on the different uh, pros and cons of every one of these materials in a little while. And in 73, 1973, the first moldable acrylic material was introduced uh, with tissue conditioning and for functional impressions. And finally, we get to our last slide here with the dental impression history timeline is 1982. This was the game changer here, the vinyl polysiloxane or VPS or PBS, whatever you want to call it. And this material has been pretty much widely used in the industry and the most widely used material over the years. And it's changed. There are a lot of different companies have VPS materials. 
And a lot of them are, are, are good. Some of them aren't as good as others. And uh, you want to make sure we're going to be, you're going to be using a material that's going to be a quality oriented material and it kind of give you consistent results. So that's a pretty cool timeline there, you know, from uh, uh, to all those years. And we came up to buy vinyl polysiloxane. So let's talk a little before I get started there, you know, you know with so many, I want to just mention this, with so many uh, different choices of impression materials on the market and so many various techniques, it's, you know, it's no wonder that inaccurate impressions are still the number one reason for remakes. And, you know, but following successful protocols and utilizing the correct materials can make life so much easier. Uh, for the dentist, for the patient, and for us, the dental technician, and resulting in perfect uh, fitting restorations. And, you know, for full denture impressions, and we're going to talk about this in a little while, always remember to board mold your trays. This will ensure capturing all the anatomical landmarks needed for a great full denture impression. And then utilize the correct material for crown and bridge. And we'll go through that in a few minutes also. And implant impressions. And two popular choices, like I just, you just saw with polyether and vinyl polysiloxane. And one thing with polyether, you know, it enables excellent dental reproduction in a wet environment. It displaces moisture right from the start for void, void free impressions. And VPS materials are, are widely used, like I just mentioned, by dental professionals all over the world. And this is intrinsically hydrophobic, you know, choosing the correct type of high quality material for the specific restoration following the proven techniques will always result in successful impression taking. So one of the important things here for a successful case of course, impressions, uh, bite registration, uh, my video is not working yet, bite registration, uh, and also uh, you know, just to correct um, communication on these, these types of cases. So I just mentioned remake factors. So let's look at the remake factors here. The number one remake factor is still inaccurate impressions. I, and you know, even, even with um, uh, digital impressions, you, know, you still have to do quality control with digital impressions and look at these impressions and you know make sure they're correctly before be corrected before the case is started. You know, if you see something in the beginning of the case with quality control, I always tell everybody just let's nip it in the bud and start from scratch. And number two is inaccurate occlusal registrations, uh, poor shade communication, the wrong choice of materials. We have to use quality materials also. So, yeah, but still number one phone call we make in the laboratories is on impressions, you know, and uh, inaccurate impressions. Really important. So let's talk about VPS here. Now, what are the VPS impressions? We talked about a little bit about that before. They're made with a poly, vinyl polysiloxane and material, and they're widely used. And the material is hydrophobic and to increase hydrophilicity. And it has sort of like soap-like molecules called surfactants. You know, even when we're pouring models uh, in a laboratory, we use surfactant. Uh, so we, we, we have that uh, more accurate, accurate model. And the same thing with this type of material. And they're also sometimes called PVS impression materials or polyvinyl siloxane materials. So a lot of different names for these. Uh, some people call it VPS, PVS, as long as, long as it's a good material and uh, it's a, it's a, it's, it, it provides you with consistent quality and consistent impressions every time. So they're available in so many different viscosities. And this is where uh, a lot of people get confused. You know, you have to use the right viscosity for the right type of case. And, uh, you know, they're, they're also available as alginate alternatives for preliminary impressions also. So, you know, we'll talk about those light body, medium body, fast set, slow set, medium set. It's a lot of different choices out there and you wanna make sure you're utilizing the, these materials for the right situation. And then there's polyether, and there's a lot of benefits for polyether too. It enables excellent dental reproduction in a wet environment, like I mentioned, and it displaces moisture. And they're great for implant impressions. Polyether offers a rigidity after setting, uh, especially with setting those copings in place, ensuring pre precise placement of implants. Uh, even though we get that precise impression, we still want to follow the protocol with, with a verification index also in the implant cases, and we'll go through that protocol in a, in a little while. So, and also with polyether, it stays flowable throughout its working time, capturing all the finer details with fewer voids. So, personal preferences, you know, doctors have, each doctor has their personal preference, and you know, uh, in a laboratory, you know, we, when we see cases and uh, they start coming in, and we start seeing consistent problems with these cases with uh, voids and, and just inaccurate impressions and, and some of the troubleshooting I'm gonna show you in a, in a few minutes, then we get together with the doctor and we, we, we talk about, hey, there might be a problem with the material or the technique, maybe it's time to change materials. So um, it's, it's important. So speaking of distortion, what causes distortion? 
You know, it's you know we want predictability with impression techniques and materials. So some of the things with distort that causes distortion is the working time. It succeeded, and the flowability is already impaired when that happens. You know, so you want to select a material with sufficient working time. I mentioned earlier, fast set, medium set. You know, uh, uh, you know, just you want a slow set. You want to make sure you have the setting time that's uh, available for you, what you're comfortable with, and the amount of time you have to work with the patient. So, and don't exceed that working time and watch those instructions and follow the instructions for use and, and pay attention to those storage temperatures. Working times are reduced due to the higher temperatures of the product. And I like to mention this, even with uh, other materials that we utilize, say for instance, in a laboratory with denture acrylics, where you, we're utilizing acrylics or repair material uh, and uh, even sometimes composites, you know, if the, the hotter the temperature, the faster these are gonna set up and it's less working time. So make sure those, you know, the temperature, keep an eye on the temperature, that has an effect also. And then you have delamination of impression materials in the tray. So we want to use a good tray adhesive. You know, good use of, if you're using polyvinyl, use a good polyvinyl tray adhesive, you know, and you, you can use it for all types of impression trays and apply that adhesive on the bottom and in the insides and the inner, inner parts of that tray. You know, I see sometimes it's uh, that some of the impression materials li lifting away from the tray, and I see this there's there's um, uh, uh, adhesive in certain areas and, and no adhesive in other areas. So we want to be could be consistent with the way you use that adhesive. And you can also use tray adhesive using gauze on dual arch trays. You can also use that adhesive on the gauze. You know, and certain trays have a self retentive fleece strip, which is great because it eliminates the need for a tray adhesive. But I still recommend it's at least some tray adhesive because it pretty much has like a, you know, a lip in there, which holds on holds that impression material in place. So moving on also the lack of support or insufficient stabilization of the tray during polymerization or during setting time. So you really want to support that tray until the impression material is sufficiently set. Stabilize the tray after seating and avoid any movements. You know, one, one of the things that we get in the laboratory, sometimes we call it double impressing. We get that's because the patient is actually moving and moving the uh, asking the patient to hold it and it's moving it around, or the dentist is not holding it stable enough in the mouth, and we get an inaccurate impression. I see this a lot with opposing um, uh, cases like uh, uh, opposing arches. And we have counter models and, and things like that, or the antagonists. And I see some uh, a lot of the times with distortions on that. So, <clears throat> so when taking the impression of the upper jaw, you can easily find support on the chin or the cheekbone of the patient, and that helps out a lot. You know, so and with impressions for the lower jaw, uh, and you can't really maneuver it or get that tray in there, just have the patient close a little bit and without biting down on the tray. And try to avoid correcting the position of the tray after insertion. You know, that's going to cause this distortion also. So all these things take into consideration uh, when you're taking that impression. So, and then distortions during impression removal. That's another key factor. You know, so one of the things is, you know, you, you, you want to ensure the impression tray is the proper size prior to taking the impression. And the material has excellent elastomeric properties. Remove the impression tray along the axis of the prepared tooth and make sure that the impression material is completely set before removal. You know, and I've and just make sure, we're gonna talk about this too, that the dates, the dates on, the, uh, on your impression material also, I can't tell you how many times we, we see impression materials not fully set because it's not gonna set because it's, it's, you know, some of it's expired a year, a year or two ago. So make sure you follow this, uh, look at the dates of the expiration on those packages. And use a rigid tray. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stress this a little bit more uh, in a little while too. You know, use a rigid tray. We don't want something that's gonna be flexible, especially with dual, dual large trays, you know, and impression material for low flexibility and high shore hardness are beneficial to stabilize the impression, but you really wanna use an impression, a, a rigid tray, even with a uh, dual arch or, or triple tray type of impression. And use materials that offer heavy body options and are suitable to be used with dual arch trays. And the combination of the tray and impression material is not appropriate. Do not use a highly viscous putty material in combination with a flexible plastic tray because it's not going to work. It's not, you're going to have distortion. It's really, really important to realize that. And, and dual arch trays can be deformed during impression taking, even with patients biting down. When you're taking a dual arch tray, you, you know, you're taking an impression of the prep, the preparations and the opposing uh, uh, arch. And, you know, this, sometimes the patient bites down into an area uh, of the plastic on the tray and starts distorting it. And this is when we have problems with our final restoration with fit. 
but what causes unclear margins in dental impressions? And this is, you know, something we look at all the time in a laboratory. And we're hoping that, you know, before it goes out of the operatory, you can quality, you quality control on these impressions and take a look at these uh, impressions. And if you have unclear margins, take a new impression, you know, and uh, to, you know, we want predictability with these, these impressions. So, so some of the problems can be thick blood or saliva that has pooled around a preparation. You want to rinse and dry the prep prepared area and stop any bleeding by using the appropriate retraction technique and hemostatic agent. And liquids or paste based on aluminum chloride, or aluminum sulfate, or iron sulfate are su suitable for hemostatic agents. And the use of an astringent re retraction paste uh, really works well too. I know uh, you know we have a, a lot of uh, our clinicians using this retraction paste. And then in conjunction with uh, a paste, they also using the retraction cord. And some of them use both processes. You know, and you know retraction paste is an application for a great application for one to three teeth. Easy access to tight interproximal areas and long-lasting hemostasis as it's proved. And it's a 15% aluminum chloride, uh, chloride paste. And it's gentle on a tissue with less risk of tissue trauma and hemorrhaging and better comfort for the patient and effective retraction, you know, as opposed to sometimes with the use of ret retraction cord, you know, uh, it, it's a little bit different. You know, sometimes it's diff difficult to accurately pl place this cord. The cord has to be cut to uh, the size for each procedure. And there's a rich risk of gingival inflammation with these cords also, and a higher risk of hemorrhaging. But, you know, even with uh, digital impressions, we'll talk about this later also, is that, you know, I, I see a, a, some great results using both methods, you know, retraction cord and the paste at one, at one at the same time. So it really works out well. So we want that excellent retraction, for that nice, clear impression. If it doesn't look clear, please retake that impression. Otherwise, it's, you know, it's going to hold up the patient. It's going to hold up you in the, in the office, create more chair time, create more opportunity time, and have an effect on your uh, ROI. You know, so um, it's, uh, it's important. So this is what I mentioned before, in, inhibition of setting time uh, due to uh, acidic retraction and also because of, uh, you know, the, the, the date being, uh, you know, it's, it, it's an old type of material. So, uh, you know, so aluminum ferric salts affect this. And we want to thoroughly rinse that preparation of water and dry it before taking the impression. Of course, you see that picture on the left, look what, what can happen. So you got the inhibition of setting time for that. So, and then um, the inhibition of setting time of the impression material due to contact with salt from latex gloves. I think we're pretty much all aware of this now. Over the years, we've seen you know, detrimental effects you know, with the latex gloves you know, and, have, and, and not having the uh, uh, impression material set correctly. But used gloves do not, that do not contain traces of sulfur. Uh, and most of the time you're gonna be using nitrile gloves, which works, works great. A lot of things are taken into consideration with these impression materials. So, and then impression materials stored at too low of a temp temperature. I mentioned temperature before, you know, higher temperature, you, it, uh, it, you risk the material setting quickly, but at a lower temperature, it might take too long to set. So store the impression material at room temperature. You know, uh, it's uh, and lower temperatures lead to higher viscosities also in this type of BPS material. And the incorrect storage conditions of the final impression, you know, after disinfecting uh, uh, rinse impressions of water and dry before sending it to the lab and, and utilize the correct um, uh, disinfection material because it has effect, an effect on different impression materials. You know, glutaraldehydes are used mostly with the PVS materials, uh, but just make sure you're using the correct material uh, for disinfection, because that can distort the, the impression also. And I've seen this many, many times in the lab. So, uh, you know, store the impressions at room temperature and away from direct sunlight. Again, with the inaccurate dis disinfection, use the recommended disinfection. So not exceed the immersion time. Um, and I've seen this firsthand too, even in the laboratory uh, over the years, going in and teaching and, and watching what uh, the different laboratories do. Sometimes I left in the uh, solution too long and that distorts it. And I used to lecture on infection control and uh, utilizing different, uh, uh, different, liquid, different types of uh, disinfectants. And uh, it, had a, it played a real detrimental part in a lot of these, uh, the, the outcome of the quality of these impressions. So. Another issue is what causes dental impressions to tear at the margins. You know, we, call, we talked a little bit about that before, but, you know, smear layers from custom temporary or provisional cements or core buildup materials, you know, so they have an effect 
on uh, on just having that uh, that have the material not being accurate. You know, be sure to move the the, the smear layer completely prior to impression taking with alcohol uh, or by polishing. And check the surrounding teeth and tissue for any residue at all, because this is, can have an effect on um, uh, on the material. And when you're fabricating your provisionals, you fabricate them after taking the final impression or remove the air inhibited layer on the exposed preparation with alcohol. Because all, most of the light cure materials you're gonna be using for these provisionals, they have that oxygen inhibited layer, which stays there. And it's a tacky layer, which has an effect on the impression material. And don't use impressions already used to fabricate provisionals for subsequent precision impression taking. You know, so you know a lot of times when you're making provisional intraorally using that uh, you know that uh, that provisional material inside the impression. So you know if you can, it, it has an effect on the impression also. So just take you want to really cleanse that area, clean it off nicely, and then take an, a new accurate impression. And it's a temporary is removed prior to the impression taking. Again, remove those residues and cement and clean the abutment tooth. In case of the core buildup material, remove the air inhibition layer. That's like I mentioned earlier. And then we have the premature removal of the impressions. You know, a lot of times you'll get this, you get tearing uh, around the margin areas. So follow the manufacturer's instruction on setting time and wait for that impression to set. You know, I know, I know we get impatient and we want to get things go moving and, you know, but make sure that impression material is set and then you can, can remove it. And some impression materials have low tear resistance. You know, let the material completely set uh, with the uh, the impression material, and just look at the, the type of material you're using. Make sure it's a quality materials. I've seen the same uh, different companies have diff the same viscosity and have different tear resistance on on these materials. Yeah. So as far as voids in the, in the margins for dental impressions, what causes these? You know, and we get these also, and you know, a lot of times it's, it's going to hold us up in the laboratory. Really want to want to move forward in doing a crown or a bridge when you have those voids in the impression around. The, you know, so blood and saliva do contaminate uh, 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 those areas around the, the impression preparation. So you want to really rinse and dry the prepared area properly, stop any bleeding, and use the appropriate retraction hemostatic agents, just like I mentioned earlier. Then is the improper syringe technique. You know, keep them mixed permanently immersed in the paste to avoid the formation of air bubbles. And you know, apply a liberal amount of wash material onto the sulcus. And you know, I, I, just make sure you don't you know, start injecting and take it off and inject it again. That's when you're gonna get your, your, um, your bubbles. Start from the bottom up and cover the whole abutment tooth with the syringe material. And always keep that tip close proximity to the, proximity to the surface, it's really important. You know. And you know, I, I used to work for an impression material company. I know we well, we always profess this all the time is bleed that cartridge prior to loading the syringe, because sometimes you, you know, might you, you might have one one part of the uh, auto mix come out before the other. You know, so you might have a base come out first or the catalyst come out first. And these auto mix cartridges, you want both to come out into the same time into that auto mix cartridge. So just make sure and uh, bleed that cartridge and don't stop and start while loading the syringe. So let's talk about stock tray versus custom tray. So as you see, there you see a stock tray here, you know, it's a, uh, it's a metal tray, it's rigid, this could be good. You know, but we really wanna utilize the right fresh material with this also. You know, I see a lot of stock trays like this with alginate impressions. And using custom trays for final impressions represent a dentist's best effort to obtain an exact duplication of the prepared teeth and adjacent tissues. So, and literature demonstrates that optimum accuracy is obtained with custom trays. I like using, utilizing custom trays. There's a lot of choices out there, <clears throat> excuse me, for trays. You know, there's even newer trays that are rigid, which you could heat up in, uh, in water and it's sort of adapted like a custom tray intraorally, and they work out well too. But you wanna make sure that you're using a, a good rigid putty material. So, you know, because a majority of dentists use stock trays for final impressions. And pretty much it's with nothing wrong with that if you get a, an accurate impression. So you wanna employ a putty wash technique, a rigid, well-fitting uh, stock tray is acceptable. So just make sure you're using it. And I'll show a picture later. I have an implant impression tray I wanna show, and it's kind of flimsy. And I want something, if I'm gonna take an impression and I'm spending all this time taking an accurate impression, you wanna use something that's rigid. And a putty wash two-step technique with a controlled bulk in a stock tray can be used as an alternative to a custom tray and provides accurate impressions. And <clears throat> these are a lot of studies that have been done with different um, you know, stock trays and different custom trays. You know, so even though I like custom trays, that they're made a lot easier now, you can utilize 
digital technology to make custom trays now. It works out great, especially with implant cases and open tray techniques. You know, it really works out well. So, uh, and custom trays, you know, with like your material, uh, they don't really take that long to make. They're not super expensive, you know. So if you have a difficult arch where you really don't have a stock tray that's really going to uh, be compatible, get a custom tray made, you know. So it's, it's, I really, I like to go with the custom tray technique, but stock trays also work if utilizing the right material and the right tray. So this is a putty material and with a lighter body material and the stock tray. This is a metal tray. We really don't have to worry about rigidity in this type of impression. But, um, and then we get to dual arch trays. You know, dual arch trays are often used to generate impressions, prepare teeth and of the opposing arts simultaneously. Yeah, I've seen so many problems over the years with uh, dual arch trays or triple tray impressions and then if they're not taken correctly. You know, we get a lot of triple tray and dual arch tray impressions in the laboratory. But there is concern that accuracy of the cast generated with this technique can be affected by the type of the tray. You know, really have to look at that. Then the viscosity of the impression material and the sequence of pouring the cast. And, you know, you know, you're going through all this trouble with taking these impressions using the correct materials and trays too. It's on us at the laboratory to utilize the right gypsum materials. And we'll touch on that in a minute also. So, so let's talk about crown and bridge impressions. So most of the crown and bridge impressions I'm seeing today is, is with, with a, as a light body wash with, a, uh, with a, maybe a heavy body or a monophase type of material over it. And uh, they could be very accurate to be utilizing a good quality material. So when we talk about dual arch impressions, you know, like we just put that light body material uh, applied to the prepared teeth and uh, and then we have the putty, a heavy putty material inside the tray. And I've seen it done both ways. I've seen a little bit of that light body put inside on top of the um, heavy body or, or monophase material and then put around the um, uh, the teeth, uh, the prep teeth. So the material is less viscous and wets the surface and preps better when you're utilizing this type of material. So. And then the heavy body material is placed in the tray and then we take a nice impression of the prep and then we have just the heavy body material on the opposing side so the patient can bite into this uh, and do uh, and take and, and you get that that dual arch impression now i always like to stress too you know i know we're going to have a bite registration and we have an impression of the prep at the same time but i always ask our doctors please if you can take even another a wax bite or a polyvinyl bite to go along with this is going to help us really tremendously help us because what happens is a lot of time that patient is biting down into maybe the plastic part of the tray or the support part of the net tray and then not we're not getting the correct occlusal record you know so that's why i always like to ask for that extra bite registration i know it's a little more time consuming but maybe maybe five minutes more and it's going to help us uh, make that restoration correctly so the patient bites into that impression until the material is set probably four or five minutes it's according to what kind of setting time there is on the material and then uh, we're ready to go but as you can see here on that uh, opposing arch, notice the impression material didn't even cover the national dentition, that, uh, or the dentition of the uh, maxillary arch. So it might have to be retaken. You might have not have enough there. So this particular type of case, uh, it would be great to fall back on uh, another bite registration, but I think we probably would have enough there. But most of the time, I'd like to see more going towards the gingiva uh, of the, you know, and, and, the, and the cervical of these teeth. So let's touch on implant impressions. How are we doing with time here? Oh, perfect. Okay, good. Implant impressions. Implant level or abutment level impressions with open tray or closed tray. You know, this, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of confusion on this. And, you know, we do a lot of implants in our, in our lab group and, you know, and, uh, and we'll touch on the pros and cons of, and when to do, utilize uh, an open tray or a closed tray. So with the open tray technique, you can utilize a stock tray and you can make openings in a tray, which is fine. And then you have the custom tray options. And that's what I mentioned earlier, these custom tray options, you know, especially with digital technology, we can design the tray exactly to where those abutments are. I mean, and it's this way you can actually take that nice uh, implant impression and uh, you have an open tray rather than cut, trying to cut, cut uh, openings in uh, a stock tray, we have the tray already made for you. So CAT can produce tray with exact openings. Really, that's, that's the way to go. That's my recommendation. I love it. It's really error free. We really have great results with that. So I had my videos here. This I don't see the videos working right now, but uh, what I'm doing, just showing um, 
yeah, the video is not working on here. Sorry about that. So what it's just showing is just uh, uh, taking the open tray technique and you know the doctor injected material around the uh, the abutment area and the impression compression coping and he's unscrewing the uh, the uh, uh, the abutment there the uh, impression coping rather and taking this out of the mouth we want to be careful and take it out very slowly and make sure that you're not tearing uh, the, uh, the material so the impression tray is coated with adhesive and loaded with a heavy body impression material or like a monophase material Concurrently, light body impression material is expressed around the copings to capture the morphology of the soft, soft tissue. And, you know, we still get impressions, implant impressions without capturing the morphology of a soft tissue or the accuracy of the soft tissue. We really need this, you know, we really need to have that accuracy and that impression of the, of the soft tissue. Monophrase material can be used, like I mentioned, and as convenient and practical alternative to the heavy body material. You know, and I like the monophase material. It's, you know, it's, uh, to me, it's a little bit easy, easy to use. And just remember that after you secure these uh, impression copings in, in the uh, open tray, take a Q-tip and wipe across the occlusal opening to expose the, uh, you know, to expose the, uh, the occlusal openings and the screw, because that's sometimes it's hard to find. You know, so we have to, when you, when you want to take that tray out of the mouth, you have to unscrew it. You know, after everything's set, sometimes it's hard to find. So uh, just make sure for that. So. So open tray technique, we see some photos here. And this is the picture I wanted to show earlier with this tray here. And you know, we've seen all seen these trays, these are disposable trays. And if you squeeze them, you know, on a lingual area and a buckle area, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna really flex, you know. And I'm not too crazy about these types of trays. So there are more rigid trays out there. If you're gonna use a tray like this, and if you're gonna cut the opening in it, I would suggest using a more rigid tray. It's really important. And this, this is showing the open tray technique. This is the heavy body material. And you see just removing it from the, uh, from the patient's mouth by unscrewing that uh, screw out of the uh, impression coping. So closed tray versus open tray technique. So key points, the open tray technique is specifically indicated when implants are not really sufficiently parallel and you have that divergency issue. And you know, why not, we wanna allow an impression to be withdrawn from, several, from multiple impression copings. And this can be easily done when we have an open tray. And the closed tray impression technique is utilized when implants are sufficiently parallel to one another. So there can be a big problem here if you're using a closed tray and you have all these, uh, the, you know, the, these different divergence issues with these uh, implants. So it might be difficult to get it in the mouth, especially when you're using that heavy body material. It could be locked in the mouth. I've seen doctors having to cut trays out of the mouth because of this, uh, this instance. So be careful there, key point there. So with closed tray technique, as you see here, you know, there's some photos here uh, at, uh, on the left-hand side, a stock tray, a custom tray can also be used. And the closed tray impression copings are placed on implants, all multi-unit abutments, and the impression is made, as you can see here on the left-hand side. So beautiful photos. You know, once the impression material polymerizes, and it's just this large from the closed tray impression and it's taken out of the mouth. We don't have to worry about unscrewing anything from the impression, uh, the impression tray, the outside of the tray. The closed tray copings are then removed and implant and in, in abutment analogs are attached to the coping, coping. And then the combined coping analog assembly, assembly is then inserted into the impression. And we do, we do this at the laboratory and then we pour our models. We pour our soft tissue models and then we pour our stone models. <clears throat> this is why it's so important to get that impression of that soft tissue, an accurate impression of that soft tissue. So some special considerations, you know, we're talking about implants, no matter what you do, just you have to follow the protocol on, on implant cases. Um, and you know, we have a lot of protocols from preliminary impressions all the way to this. This is an instance where we're doing a bar trying, but the thing I want you to remember, it's just, we always have to do, uh, you know, a verification index when we're doing uh, even a large bridge uh, and I'd like to do a verification index, especially with uh, these hybrid cases or hybrid bar cases or full arch restorations. Really important. So again, I'm gonna review a little bit some things to consider. Implant impressions, you would choose a custom full arch or quad, quadrant impression tray. And also in this instance, take a separate bite registration with the best results. You know, and when using a dual arch impression tray, make sure the patient doesn't bite onto the tray support using a heavy body material in the impression tray and a light body material around the impression coping to eliminate any voids. So keep in mind the open tray technique is required when implants are not parallel. And so I like to just drill that into you because you know a lot of times we, you know, we still see those closed tray impressions on divergent uh, implants. 
So from there, we're going to go over to dentures, you know, because we only have an hour here. So I'm trying to uh, squeeze everything into an hour. And this is what I talked about before, relining impressions from below and over denture. This happens to be a locator denture. It could be, an, uh, you know, a different type of attachment technique uh, uh, that we have in the denture. It could be a Ryan 83 attachment. It could be, you know, uh, there's so many different attachments on the market, uh, on the market today, uh, you know, that you can utilize. But the first thing I get asked all the time is, Dennis, what should we do to take a reline impression for an overdenture? And some people say, well, we just, let's just put impression material inside and snap that denture back onto the, uh, uh, onto the uh, implants and then uh, onto the abutments and uh, we can take an, uh, a nice reline impression. Well, I found that to be real detrimental over the years. So I recommend grinding out the denture, the housings from the denture and then retrofit that denture. Make sure it's a passive fit because what you're gonna do now, you're gonna put some new uh, housings and new attachments over those uh, those abutments. So we wanna create the space with a carbide burr and there's a lot of different kits out there from different companies where you can utilize and you create that space in these dentures. And uh, so there's special carbide burrs and different kits out, different kits out there. There's a, a chair side recess burr. There's a number of different companies that make kits that you can utilize. You know, and some of these, uh, uh, the tools that come in the kits are undercut bars, vent bars, trim bars, grinding bars, recess burrs, uh, burrs I meant to say, and polishing burrs. Uh, but um, uh, just make sure you make that little vent hole too when you're processing these interorally, you know, and uh, but most of the time we get asked to process these attachments in the lab. So this is the, uh, happens to be the locator cap. Like I said, you there's so many different materials, a lot of different materials out there on the market. It could be an ERA attachment, could be a Prime 83, could be uh, um, uh, this type of uh, case here with an overtension case with a locator. But what we're going to do next is place that uh, uh, cap on the abutment, and uh, and then we're ready to take that impression. And uh, but make sure you use a blackout spacer also. And usually these are the silicone rubber white spacers that you place on there before you put that um, that housing with the attachment on there. And then you have the other processing kits. You know every every company has their processing kit, and many times what you're going to be using is the processing uh, attachment. But some, I'm not crazy about using this because sometimes the retention on those are just not enough. There's not enough retention. They move around too much. So, so we're going to use, it says use a marking material to verify passive fit, but you know if it's going to be passive or not. If it comes out easy, easily with no contact on the housing. And if you, you can use, a, you know, like I said, you can use a marking material just to check to make sure and put that around the, uh, the attachments. And if you see that marking inside the denture, then you know you have to relieve it a little bit more. Roughing up the borders. You know, we still want to maintain the borders uh, of these dentures because this is going to help with retention. You know, so it's a combination of retention here. It's with borders, with tissue, and with the attachments when it comes to over dentures. So there's a different methods of border molding. You know, I recommend, I like the border molding technique of using a, 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 a heavy body material on the periphery, putting some adhesive there, heavy body material, a monophase material on the periphery, put it in the patient's mouth, and then have the patient move their cheeks around. And we wanna capture all that musculature in the mouth and then come over it with a, a light to medium body material. In this instance, I don't recommend, you know, relining a case with overdentures. I don't recommend a light body material. I recommend a medium body material. So it really can capture those housings and pull them and, and get a good impression. So after you get that border molding done, all we're gonna do is just, uh, you know, you're gonna put more adhesive on the inside, take an impression, and then uh, we're gonna send that to the laboratory and we're gonna process it for you in the laboratory. And now, you know, the reason why I'm not crazy about doing the doing it with the other method where we leave those attachments in and do a wash with the, the original um, housings and uh, attachments in there, because many times it doesn't seed all the way and you get a lot of impression material inside where the, uh, where the attachments were, where the nylon rings are, the attachments or locators are. So just be careful of that. So, you know, I recommend this method because it's been proven effective and it's consistent, has been consistent over the years. <clears throat> so this is the impression after it's pulled and you can see, you know, the denture, if the denture caps stay inside the mouth, the locator caps in the mouth, just take them out and we can insert them back. And we use a model analog, an impression analog, and we pour a model and we reline the case, so. This is the way I, you know, we, I get asked a lot. This is why I included this in, in this presentation. I get asked a lot on reline attachments. And there's your model analog. More impression analog. Here we go. So that's the way to do it. You know, if you have any you know, more questions on that, you can always email me with other questions. I can go into this more, but we don't, we really don't have enough time here. So we're going to talk a little bit about denture impressions. And I'm going to touch on this now because, you know, it's important. You know, we want to utilize a stock tray 
and take a, a preliminary impression with a good quality alginate material. And make sure you capture all the anatomical, anatomical landmarks, because usually when you get a good uh, preliminary impression, we're gonna make a good custom tray to get that final impression. And I use a light cured custom tray material, and I, I go about two to three millimeters short of the border when I'm making these trays, because I want you to, to you know, to border mold this and, and have some room for some the impression material for border molding. And this is just another photo of the tray. And so that's why I make it a little bit shorter so you can border mold it and give us a good accurate impression in the laboratory. So, but what about tissue stops? I have, still have a lot of doctors asking us to make tissue stops. And, and this actually just creates space for the impression material uh, in, the, uh, you know, in the tray. And it also helps stabilize the tray, stabilize the tray. But the thing is, I see a lot of the times that there's too much pressure put on those tissue stops. And we, we can actually see the marks into the, in our denture, on our model, in our final model, and we have to relieve those areas. So, uh, or you know, block those areas out. So just be careful if you're using tissue stops, we still get a lot of requests for these, but you wanna make sure, and we never put a tissue stop on the papilla because that's gonna compress the papilla. And we utilize that papilla when, we use it, when we're setting up denture teeth. You know, that's gonna be one of our anatomical landmarks when we're setting up denture teeth. We usually go about six to eight millimeters out from that papilla. We block out any undercuts on the model when we're making cups and trays, so it'll eliminate any locking into the tray and it'll give you some more room for impression material. Preferations on tray. Yeah, I use perforated trays sometimes if the doctor's taking an alginate impression, but a lot of times with polyvinyl impressions, if it's too viscous and, or it's, it's too runny, uh, it's going to come out, the, uh, the polyvinyl material is going to come out of those holes in the tray and you're going to be losing a lot of impression material. So uh, preparation is good, po possibly around the border areas to lock those into place, but you still have to use adhesive. You know, just don't forget to use that adhesive. So, so that second, second visit is gonna be that custom tray impression. Uh, again, border molding is important. I talked about this earlier, same method as I mentioned earlier. You can use a compound material if, if you want to. There's another method of utilizing the border molding. And then what about a functional tray? with functional occlusal rim. And this is where we save a visit in a dental office when we're making a denture, where you can actually, we actually make a custom tray with an occlusal rim on top of it. And you can border mold the tray and take a good uh, functional occlusal rim at the same time. And this is really, this is a really good method to, 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 to utilize. It really helps us in the laboratory. It saves time, but it also gives us all the information we need to move ahead with the, uh, with the final setup for try-in. So this is the master models of the functional tray and functional impression. And bite registrations using the functional impression with therapeutically designed bite rims is, is, is one of the most reliable ways to transfer the oral situation to the articulator. And we want to feel like we have the patient with us at the bench when we're working on these cases. You know, so we want to mimic natural jaw movement. And this is one of the ways to do it, especially when you're using a semi-adjustable or fully adjustable articulator. And this is that uh, functional impression with a bite registration. This doctor just took a nice border mold and impression here. Doctor liked to have full borders on his dentures. And it worked out really well. So what happens when it comes back to the laboratory? We pour a model and we have to do a denture setup <clears throat> and we want to maintain all the information that we had, but that tray is fitting too loose because there was impression material in there. So what I'm going to do is I want to make a new base plate. I'm going to make a new base plate, but I want to, I'm going to make a putty index first, put the midline and cuspid lines at the doc, the information that the doctor gave me. And I'm going to have the exact information. I'm going to make a new base plate. And as you can see here, so I have a nice fitting base plate. It's gonna fit almost like the final denture. And I start setting my denture teeth according to the information the doctor gave me on the occlusal rim. And my six anteriors set. I set my lower six anteriors and the guidelines with the upper anteriors. And then we're ready to finish setting our denture teeth. So, so for that final impression, there's a lot of different materials out there. The rubber base, we still get rubber base impressions. And I love rubber base on, on full, full impressions. It really, we have some great impressions uh, and quality impressions we get, but uh, just make sure you're using a high quality material and examine them carefully for accuracy. So this is a beautiful impression here. This is the distorted impression, loss of detail from excess saliva, pressure areas or overextension of the trays. You know, we see the trays showing through we know there's gonna be a problem. There's probably gonna be sore spots. There's probably gonna be instability with these trays. So I would ask for a custom tray, a custom tray on that. And how about this uh, impression here? This poor patient was probably lying back in the chair. That impression material went all the way down the patient's throat. And this is an actual case. I had to take a picture. But you see all that impression material that came out of there. And I don't think there was any adhesive on here. Plus there were, wasn't any border molding. 
So if I got a case like this in the laboratory, I would ask for a new impression to be taken. Hopefully the patient could be in an upright position so they don't have to swallow that impression material. That's a beautiful impression there. And you know, once we get that back in the laboratory, you wanna make sure that, and you can do this in the dental office too, make sure you bead and box that impression. You know, if you're pouring these uh, in the dental office, because you went through all that trouble of border molding, you wanna maintain those borders. And I mentioned earlier about pouring the right with the correct stone. You want to use a quality stone, something that's going to set correctly. Usually with full dentures, I'm using a type three stone or yellow stone. Uh, and uh, with partials and crown and braids, of course, I'm using a type four stone. And you might be asking why, what are you using a type three stone? It's because, you know, if the denture has really bad undercuts and we're processing in the case, we want to remove that denture after it's processed from the model. We don't want that denture to brace, break. We want the model to break first before the denture breaks. So a type three stone has less compressive strength to it. And a type four stone has more compressive strength. So that's why we utilize that for crown and bridge. And then we have this type five stone and we have resin reinforced stone also. So you have more compressive strength with a type four stone. You want to make sure we're utilizing a vacuum mixer. It's great for partial dentures because it has resistance to abrasion and also with crown and bridge. <clears throat> and also with pickup impressions, you know, we get a lot of pickup impressions on existing dentures or we're making a, a, denture, a crown under a denture. And sometimes we're getting this real heavy body material with a pickup impression and we can't get that denture out of, out, of the, uh, out of the impression and wind up breaking it. So just be careful, you know, that you maybe use maybe a medium body material if you're using polyvinyl or something like this for a denture like this, take an alginate and it works really well, you know, so we could do that. So it repairs and fresh for crowns under a partial, the same thing, just be careful. I've seen so many uh, partial dentures bend over the years with trying to get impressions out of like a really heavy impregum or polyether impression or heavy body impression. So winding it up here, I just wanted some more things to consider here. Full arch impressions, more, more of a review. Full arch impressions should be taken with rigid impression trays. We talked about that earlier. And fully indentialist impressions, make sure the border mold and dual arch impressions, just make sure that tray is rigid also. Okay, and that preliminary impression, utilize a good quality alginate material. And, uh, and then that re on your, your retraction, the ad adequate retraction is really one of the most important things with crown and bridge cases. So a quality retraction cord of paste must be used. So we're going to touch, what time is it? Oh, yeah, we have time. I'm going to touch on digital technology here. Just going to touch on that. Not, we're not going to get into it too much here. That's a whole other course. We have specialists in our company with digital technology. They give, they'll give you these courses. We have upcoming courses with that. Uh, but, you know, intraoral scans, you know, it's becoming more and more popular. You know, digital dentistry is a method of gathering data, planning, designing, and manufacturing dental appliances and devices. And it aids in the dentist and, 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 and the laboratory in the diagnostic process. Really important. So, you know, we want to look at the, some of the basics here. You know, we still want to have, you know, lip and cheap, cheap retractors so we can get capture what we need to capture and see what we need to see when we're taking these digital impressions. And retraction is really important. I'm not going to go through each one of these products, which is a, it's just a lot of different products to choose from out there. And then, uh, you know, as far as, as, far as uh, moving the tongue away, you know, there's, there's different devices for that. You want to make sure you capture, you know, can move that tongue away and you can scan everything. Uh, in, in an accurate way, you know, just like you, you would uh, quality, do quality control on a uh, regular traditional impression, you're going to do regular quality control uh, on uh, digital impressions also before you send the, uh, the STL files to us or the scans to us at the laboratory. Really important. So confirm you had adequate preparation reduction and occlusal clearance prior to scanning. You know, there's some, some of this is one of this is prep check. There's a lot of different checking devices you can, you can uh, utilize out there, but it's important to have that clearance. And then you look at, you know, as far as, you know, uh, quality control on these impression materials, you know, there's, there's room for improvement, you know, for inadequate tissue retraction and data capture. You know, look at what we see here on the left-hand side, right towards the right lower uh, section here. You know, it's just, you can see this, is you know, like not capturing, capturing that full retraction there and that full, gin, the, uh, full um, margin area. So that's important. You can see that on the screen also which is great. You know, I love seeing, even with digital dentures, I love to see that on the screen and looking at all the different um, uh, quality oriented parts of that impression. And if we see something that's inferior, we can see it right away. So, and a super ginger finish line is preferred. And, you know, this can be accomplished for your traction cord, your traction paste, or both.
So let's look at this picture here. Notice the same prep with the same, same scan time. The top has, you know, with, without proper iso isolation and gingival tissue retraction. And you can see that on, on the right-hand side on the top, that we, you didn't capture a good uh, impression of that, uh, that prep here. And then redoing it with the proper retraction, we have a beautiful impression here, beautiful digital impression. Good gingival tissue retraction is important. And, um, you know, uh, exposure to the preparation of the margin is required when scanning, just like it is with when you're taking a uh, traditional impression. I'm not gonna go through all the different, we talked about that earlier uh, with different uh, materials and the retraction paste, but you know, there's a lot of scanners to choose from. It can, it can get pretty confusing. You know, you go to a dental show now, there's so many different booths with sc scanners and different people trying to sell you scanners. Just utilize the one that's gonna be good for you and one that's gonna be good for your patients and give you the consistent results every time. And again, we have experts in our company that can help you with this. If you need more information on integral scanners or courses, or just learning how to utilize them and utilize them in your operatory, just let us know about it, okay? But there's a little learning curve. You know, Sometimes it takes up to 20 scans you know, before you're really learning what you're doing and knowing what to look for in scanning some of these cases, especially with uh, you know, uh, bridges and implants. So there's so many different applications between from fixed cr uh, crowns and bridges, onlays, veneers, all the way to removable partial dentures. Uh, I love, we still, we're still starting to get more and more uh, intro all scans on partial dentures now also. Surgical guides, let me just go back here. I want to just touch on that. Surgical guides, bite splints, orthodontic appliances, and sleeve appliances. So even without bite splints, we're doing a lot of bite splints. We're getting a, a ton of digital impressions now uh, with bite splints as opposed to traditional impressions. Okay, so yeah, so we want to I mean, we keep a record of uh, what, what what you're doing uh, as far as uh, your remakes. I mentioned that earlier. As far as if we see a problem consistently happening, then that that raises a flag, and we'll have a conversation about that because that can that can lead to remakes. So this is just a quick uh, snapshot of the digital implant workflow. This is an implant workflow with intraoral scanning. Of course, we do the quality control before we start. We do it at OEM implant manufacturer, then again quality control. Then we have a CAD CAM production if we're doing this with a uh, milling. Uh, and again, quality control. Everything has quality control in between each step. And then we ship that restoration and then we have that process placement. But we have more in-depth seminars on this, step-by-step -step seminars on what to do. Uh, and uh, you know, so stay, you can look at on our website and you can you know, stay tuned for further you know, uh, webinars and uh, in-person uh, seminars also. We're gonna to touch a little bit on <clears throat> full arch cases. I'm gonna end it here. What about intraoral scanning for full arch cases? I know a lot of you have questions about this. Scanning is possible, but it's still not perfect. And additional steps must be taken and case selection is critical. And you can use an indelible pencil to help with stitching issues. And, uh, you know, but cases with tissue test texture and landmarks are easier to scan uh, than without. So just keep that in mind, you know, and. One of the studies that have been done has been done by, by Professor uh, LaRusso. He did an edentulous scan strategy study, and it was called the design for optimal scan experience of edentulous patients with three-shaped trios. And if you looked at his design here, the way he did this directional design on, on, on scanning, you know, he started off on the crest of the ridge on an upper from, from the right to the left, and then he went into the palatal area, then he went around the periphery. And he has been very successful with his scans on fully edentulous cases. So I still see issues with undercuts and areas like the hamulon notch areas, retromolar pads on digital denture. So most of the digital denture impressions that we're getting in a lab has been scanned from a wash impression or from a model. Yeah, and then we've utilized uh, digital technology for dentures. And then there was another study done on the Journal of Prosthetic Research in February, 2020. And they did a study on 29 patients. And their conclusion was within the limitations of the present study, the investigated scanners were not able to correctly fully replace a conventional impression for the fabrication of a complete denture. But look at that directional path of what they did, their scans, which was completely different than Dr. Lewis. So, uh, so that could have a, that could have played a part in it also. But uh, we've come a long way with uh, you know fully edentulous uh, scans, and I think we're going to come a long way in the next year or so. It's uh, evolving really quickly. So to wind up here, we want to evaluate accuracy before it's sent out of the lab. And this is what I hate hearing the most is, you know, in a laboratory is dentists, do the best you can. 
Because sometimes when you get those impressions and they're not accurate, you don't want to try to do the best you can and fudge. It's going to wind up being a remake. You know, look at the left-hand side here with a double impressed, uh, impression here. That's going to be a problem. The one I showed you before, you know, it's going to be a problem, you know. So, you know, accurate impression taken, great impressions ensure well-fitting restorations. And the dentist must evaluate what type of impression material impression is being taken. Whole arts, sectional, multiple, single tooth, and then choose the correct impression tray, method, material, tissue retraction. And, uh, and, and when it comes to evaluating the impression, a number of factors need to be looked at, including setting time, detailed reproduction, and dimensional stability. So the ultimate goal is patient satisfaction. This is what we, we hate remakes. We want to have a good patient satisfaction record. Uh, we want to have good communication and the proper use of these materials. And I hope I helped you tonight with some of these tips and tri tricks. I know it was one hour, a lot of material. I talk fast, but I hope you got something out of it. But thank you and everybody for joining me tonight. If you have any questions, you can email me at durban at dentalservices.net.